This scene changed science fiction films forever. It was the culmination of a failed movie before it and a reaction to the most successful films in science fiction at the time. Today, we take an in-depth look at the most iconic scene of Ridley Scott's Alien, the chestburster. <laughs> There's a reason the movie Alien has stood the test of time. And much of that is the result of artists and creatives who were pioneers in the field. Each one brilliant in their own specific way, though perhaps unrecognized at the time. The specialty of each is allowed to shine under the direction of Ridley Scott. And nowhere is there a more perfect nexus than the chestburster scene. A worm in, in, a, in a living body. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Let's begin with the setting. Almost the entire movie of Alien is set on an interstellar spaceship called the Nostromo. The interiors of the ship are a direct reaction to Stanley Kubrick's vision of the future in 2001 A Space Odyssey, and to a smaller extent, Star Wars. You can see here pristine spaceship interiors and gleaming future technology. It's extraordinarily pretty, almost like technological pornography, but it also looks like the world's cleanest human lives there. And so with Star Wars a few years later, you began to see a better idea of the utility of spaces, how humans inhabit them and how they're used. But Alien took this idea even further. The interiors of the Nostromo were designed after the cockpits of B-52s and submarines, both suboptimal spaces humans are forced to inhabit, coexisting with bulky technology they rely on to survive, using and abusing them in a way where form follows function the habits and vices of human life springing up in the cracks between machines. This idea of utility and design continues through all of the interior set design in Alien. This was not an accident. Ron Cobb, one of the designers who described his design aesthetic as a frustrated engineer, set out to make it that way. He even went so far as to create something he called semiotic standard. Essentially, this was a set of bold pictograms or icons that function as crew signage. It creates a space at once futuristic, but also one to which we as the audience can readily understand, identify, and relate. It's a subtle touch that helps we as viewers understand the space these characters inhabit, without necessarily understanding the inner workings of interstellar space travel. This guy thinks like something's engineered. He's got a mind that he designed something that really seems like it'll work. It's an aesthetic that Ron Cobb would push through every aspect of his design on the film, all the way down to Jonesy's cat box. Meow. The result is the experiences of these characters now seem closer to ours. The film may take place in the future, but in this scene where the crew shares a meal, their experience seems not unlike our own. This is important because the horror of this scene becomes more real when the non-horror everyday experiences of the crew seem more human. Ron Cobb would go on to design on Raiders of the Lost Ark, Total Recall, and Firefly. Yep, that Firefly, among numerous others. Most films begin with the writer, and in this case, Alien also has an amazing pedigree. Dan O'Bannon would go on to write Total Recall and Screamers, as well as Life Force, which is a cult classic in its own way, mostly for its astonishing amount of space vampire nudity. Before writing Alien, Dan O'Bannon had only written one other film, John Carpenter's directorial debut, Dark Star. It is the future. Mankind has conquered the stars. A movie for which Dan had also done special effects. Dan's terrific low-budget effects work on Dark Star would lead him to additional effects work on another film with star in the title. Oh yeah, it's that one. The script for Alien, which at this point in Dan's career was still being called Star Beast, was put aside half-finished when Dan was hired to work on a production of Dune helmed by Hodorowsky. Dune was a movie that was wholly unable to get off the ground. It failed to move into production and many of the people involved, including O'Bannon, were cut loose. And thank God, while Dune might have turned out to be amazing, Alien did. And without Dune's failure, Alien would never become the seminal sci-fi work that it was. This is because Hodorowsky had already sought out visionaries in their respective fields. Visionaries that O'Bannon would meet while working on Dune, like Chris Voss, the French artist Jean Mobius Chirot, and most importantly, Hans Rudolf Giger, the artist that would ultimately make Alien so, well, 
Alien. The exposure to his art would be a direct influence on O'Bannon to pick up the script and finish it. O'Bannon would keep pushing Fox and the producers to hire Giger throughout the pre-production process, but they only relented after O'Bannon had thrust Giger's Necronomicon into Ridley Scott's hands, who at that point realized they had the ability to create a monster that would be superior to most of those from the past, particularly in the unique manner in which they conveyed both horror and beauty. That's what Ridley Scott sounds like, right? This is the painting, uh, the old alien that Ridley Scott wanted to have for his film. H.R. Giger would go on to be responsible for designing almost everything in the film that's alien, which includes this little guy right here. Giger based the kernel of his designs for the chestburster on a triptych created in 1944 by Francis Bacon called Three Studies for Figures at the Base of a Crucifixion. His first design was described by the model builder as looking like a plucked turkey, a veined, <laughs> repulsive-looking thing with fangs. But a monster, no matter how tiny it is, is only as good as its entrance. In this case, the director Ridley Scott had attempted to keep the design for the chestburster as hidden from the cast as he could. As actor John Hurt was rigged up, the rest of the cast was kept offset. Because of the expected mess of the scene, it was going to need to be one take. Three cameras were set up to capture the birth from multiple angles, and all were covered with clear plastic tarps. The production crew had gone to a butcher shop, and star Sigourney Weaver described what was purchased as a huge vat of kidneys and livers and intestines, and said they had been floating around on set for two days, and the stench was awful. When the rest of the cast arrived, John Hurt was already on the table, though technically he was trapped beneath all of that stuff and sitting in a deck chair with just his head and arms poking through. They had already stuffed the chest cavity full of organs, which I don't know how that gets credited on a movie, like chest stuffer, organ wrangler, all of those are good options. The cast knew that the chest burster was going to pop out. They had read the script after all, but they were unsure of exactly how it would happen because the script described it in just three words. This thing emerges. Well, it didn't the first time. There was a tiny bit of a false start when the production crew realized they'd have to cut the shirt a little bit more for the chest burster to make it through. So the actors, feeling safer at this point, moved in more closely, not realizing that there were small explosives packed around the exit point and that the whole fake chest was packed with blood and guts. And so this happened when Sir Ridley called action. <laughs> Two technicians with a compressed blood machine hid below and sprayed six gallons of blood a take. Blow, Roger, and blood push out. In the end, there was so much blood, they decided it actually hurt the effect. And so they pulled it back quite a bit in editing. But they couldn't pull back the three-foot squirt of blood that hit actress Victoria Cartwright smack in the face, causing her to recoil and fall over backwards. I had two cowboy boots sticking up. I turn over, I realize they're still shitty. I have to get up and I continue acting. It's terrifying in execution, and it might actually all be thanks to fast food. Chris Foss, one of the other conceptual artists who worked extensively on Alien, claims O'Bannon had eaten some fast food and woke up in the night in incredible pain and actually had to be taken to hospital and imagined that there was a beast inside him. This experience mixed with co-writer Ron Shusett's idea for impregnation by way of facehugger became a scene unlike any 1970s audiences had ever seen before, resulting in shock and surprise. This origin of the chestburster is portrayed best not in Alien or in any of its sequels, but in a little movie called Spaceballs. Oh no, not again.